research has too often been done in silos, with great focus on a narrow area of expertise. But through shared knowledge and access to data, wider problems can be solved. From inequality to sustainability. From helping our ageing population to better ways of raising our children. It's that spark of an idea disrupting what we know. By thinking differently, our behaviour will change. This research is already happening. But now there is a new home in Cardiff that brings it together. A place open to the world that celebrates and encourages innovative thinking, collaborative working and sharing ideas. The world's first social science research park, Spark. A spark to change our futures. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Phil Swan. I'm one of the business development managers within the CPD unit at Cardiff University. Uh, it's great to have you all joining us this morning. I can see that people are still continuing to arrive. Uh, so just allow me to take a few moments to introduce you and welcome to you what is the very last session of the 2022 virtual summer school. Uh, so since the, the start of the COVID pandemic, we've organised two successful years of the summer school. Uh, the idea came about as a way of trying to give something back that was useful at a time when many conferences or all conferences and all face to face uh, training delivery was being cancelled. Uh, needless to say, it was a great success in the first year. We repeated in uh, last year in 2021 and uh, we've repeated again this year in 2022. Um, I'm just while the last few people arrive, I'm just going to go through some basic housekeeping. Uh, so this session is going to be recorded, uh, which means you're able to access uh, the back catalogue of uh, the virtual summer school sessions, not only from this year, but also from the previous two years via the CPD units uh, YouTube channel. So I recommend you do have a look at that. Um, there's some really brilliant sessions on there on quite a broad range of topics. Uh, this year, we've been very fortunate to have gained support from our academic colleagues covering a broad range of subjects, uh, things like the power of collaboration, the mysterious world of semiconductors, the future of skills and the fourth industrial revolution, uh, to, name, to name but a few. Um, if you have any IT issues during the session, any sound issues, anything of that nature, please just let us know via the chat feature of the uh, Zoom call and myself or my colleague Jess will do our very best to try and help you out. Um, if your Wi-Fi drops out, um, then please just reuse the link that we've provided for this session. Uh, Jess and I will be on the sidelines. You won't interrupt the flow of the session. We'll just readmit you back into the, in, into the talk. So please just reuse that link. Uh, we're going to be doing a questions and answers at the end of the session, so please make note of any questions that you might have and make use of the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom page. Uh, alternatively, if you wanted to post, pose the questions yourself rather than me read them out for you, you can also use the raise hands tab and, uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll unmute your mic for you as well. I believe we've also got a Mentimeter embedded into this presentation. So there'll be a bit of engagement uh, that we very much encourage you and would like you to participate in as well. Uh, finally, uh, we'll be sending out an online questionnaire at the end of the virtual summer school, which is today. Um, so that'll be going out shortly. Um, we're really keen to keep identifying sessions for future years that are relevant to you. Um, so we very much appreciate any feedback that you have around how you felt the session went and any ideas for future future sessions. Uh, so please keep an eye out for that uh, feedback form and please take a few moments just to complete that for us. That'd be much appreciated. So I think that's enough from me. I'll hand you over to our fantastic speakers that we have lined up for you this morning. Sophia and Kate from Our Lab. Thanks very much both. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, I'm going to um, start sharing my screen now. We're very excited to be able to share with you findings from our HARP project. 
um, which stands for Health Arts Research People. And it was a partnership between all of the organizations that you see in the bottom ribbon. Today, we will be talking more specifically about the power of embedding arts in healthcare. Um, as Phil mentioned, I'm a researcher um, in applied health sociology. I'm based in the Spark building as well. And I'm very delighted to be joined by Kate Strudwick, uh, who is the artistic director of Head for Arts. And she was one of our research partners as well. And she will be talking about the creative intervention um, that, that she led as well, and more broadly about the work that she's doing. So some of the partners that uh, were, we took part in our project was the Arts Council Wales, ELAB, Nesta, and also we worked in collaboration with People Powered Results uh, team, which delivered some of the coaching, the Wales Arts and Health and Wellbeing Network, and the Wales, um, the Wales NHS Confederation. So what we were really interested in is to identify the knowledge pool of what we know already about how arts and creativity can support our health and improve our health systems. And how can we contribute by promoting innovation in the arts and health sector? So what we do know is that there is growing evidence on the role of arts in improving health. There is a World Health Organization health evidence report that supported um, the evidence base. We also see published articles on how cultural activities are linked to lower mortality. Specifically in Wales, the program of government includes a commitment to investing in social prescribing to help uh, with aging, uh, social isolation and loneliness, and also to prevent um, excessive hospitalization. Also, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act 2015, as you can see in, the, um, in this um, diagram here, puts an emphasis on Wales's vibrant culture, a globally responsive Wales, a resilient Wales, and a healthier Wales. And specifically, what they mention is that they build on the philosophy of prudent healthcare and on close and effective relationships to make an impact on health and well-being throughout life and put a greater emphasis on preventing illness and supporting people to manage their own health and well-being and on enabling people to live independently for as long as they can. And here is where the arts come in. And here's where we feel that the arts can play a very powerful role. So what needs to improve? This is what our project came uh, to address, putting together arts partners and health partners to innovate, to deliver more inclusive arts projects for health and well-being, clear pathways for people to access arts for health, more sustainable funding models, a better shared understanding of the value of arts in health, and more robust evidence on impact of people in the health system, which is what we as the university try to provide. We had two programs, one's called SEED and one's called Nourish, and Kate will be talking about her project on Nourish, which focused on existing arts and health partnerships that were ready to deliver um, and test existing ideas. Our program was um, across Wales, as you can see, there's a very wide diversity of um, health boards involved, charities, as you can see, um, the nature of the conditions that are addressed is very diverse as well. I'm just going to give you now a quick example of how the arts was used in organizational development. In this particular study, um, artists uh, delivered non-creative, uh, sorry, creative non-fiction stories drawn from interviews with Black NHS workers in Wales to understand what were the experiences of providing care during the pandemic. 
So in effect there, the art was used in dissemination of the experiences of the workforce rather than an intervention on a particular group as well. And what we found is that the arts has a profoundly powerful um, role in sharing the participant experience, irrespective whether the participant is the workforce or a service user as well. In another project here, um, uh, our, 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 our charity partners in West Wales used the arts to deliver online community theater with live streamed Zoom performances and reached and connect rurally isolated and housebound individuals across Pembrokeshire. And they engage specifically um, middle-aged men who previously hadn't been involved in, um, in creative activity. So here are some photos from some of the interventions. As you can see, it's art provided by participants and also photos of creative sessions delivered in care homes. So how does the research come in? And this is what I'll be talking to you now. So what we did is um, deliver an evidence learning group to increase capacity of the professionals to um, evaluate and monitor their own projects. We synthesize the evidence, but also most importantly, we engage service users in a public involvement and patient experience in research group. And they were able to advise and give us the independent service user voice. And with the participants, we invited them to take part in interviews, focus groups, and questionnaires with SEED and Nourish teams. So these are some of the methods that we used and the ethics. Um, as you can see, it's quite detailed and also it's quite multifaceted because what we wanted to find out as researchers was what are the processes of embedding the arts within health and what are the powerful ways that this is manifested. And we're also very aware that people communicate, for example, through social media, communicate differently in focus groups and one-to-one -one presentations. So this is um, the standard process that we follow in research. Um, how do we go from reviewing the literature, developing a protocol, um, getting ethical approval, collecting the data, analyzing it, and then disseminating it. So let's have a look at how do we reach to the conclusions that we reach? We undertake a process called framework analysis where we take the data and shape it according to categories that are interesting to us. For us, it was very interesting whether organizations are in the public sector or the third sector, because there are different protocols that are followed by the public sector. And on some occasions, that was an obstacle, but when it was overcome, it was incredibly powerful because what it meant is that participants who are referred in secondary care could access a creative intervention. So these are some of our themes that um, came out and what we were interested in. And I'll take you through some of our findings. So what I'll be talking about today is what we call a process evaluation, uh, which looks at the organizational barriers to implementing arts-based interventions. And this is why in the beginning, I wanted to hear what were your views on some of the barriers. And I have to say that some of the items that you mentioned are also what um, I found as well in terms of time, complications, DBS checks, and also finances. Key to embedding the arts within healthcare and also some of the barriers are the epistemological differences between arts and health. Um, the healthcare organizations have different protocols, different thresholds for evidence. And as one of our participants said, I do not want to send people to an experiment. Now, what we also found was that staffing was an issue because often staff did not have the time to engage in this developmental work and to bring the arts in. The fact that most of our interventions were innovative 
meaning they were new. They were trying out new creative methods with new audiences meant that often staff in healthcare did not have the opportunity to know what is being delivered and what is the outcome. And therefore that gave a very unique role for our artists as boundary spanners and change agents, which meant they had to do the go-between. And these people are really important. You know, all health boards have an arts and health coordinator that can be contacted and can broker those relationships. However, as we, what we also find out is that operating in the boundaries between healthcare systems and arts systems can take a lot of time and it's invisible work and overwork. Also what we found is that service users and external stakeholders were involved very differently by different organizations and the lived experience of the artist was unique in attracting audiences. So for example, uh, black artists were much better at gaining the trust of black healthcare workers. Similarly, what we found also is that um, older artists working with older groups uh, were able to gain rapport a lot, um, a lot faster, I would say. There are also examples where a difference in demographic was really important. Um, what we also know is that there is all over uptake of arts and health activities by underrepresented groups, and that's why therefore the artist's live experience comes in. Again, looking at the impact issue, which was one very key issue in evidencing across the different languages. As I mentioned earlier, there are very different um, thresholds of evidence. One of them is measurable indicators that are particular to a, a clinical pathway versus stories and experiential knowledge, validated questionnaires versus custom-made tools. What we also know and found out was that participant experience is not available on top. What this means is that simply because you will deliver the questionnaire that is required or considered scientific, does not mean that the participants will be able to complete it, that they will be engaged. And often the artists who were delivering the sessions were key through their interpersonal links to understand the deeper impact that the arts have on, on the service users that they would not disclose in a questionnaire. Finally, we were looking at social prescribing and how people can be referred to um, two different services by link workers as well. So even though CARP was not a social prescribing project, there were a lot of connections and um, a lot of the projects progressed into exploring their social prescribing potential so that they can be included in more formal ways. When we look at impact, we were interested specifically in how, what are the dimensions of health and well being that can be improved through the arts. And what we found was that there was variation in ability and availability to engage in evaluation, and that measuring the intangible impact was a real challenge. Key to that was the importance of creating a safe space and engaging with the artists and their lived experiences in shaping the understanding of impact. Very often people on the outside, people like myself, do not have the full answers of how the art is impacting a particular demographic. So we worked very closely with our participants. So these are some self-reported impact uh, that the participants responded. The first one was pride in creative achievement which then consecutively led to confidence in socialization with strangers, because many of our participants did not know each other. They participated in a group section, in a group session. And that was quite new and challenging for some people. Overcoming the social barrier meant that they had a stronger sense of self and ability to better manage their condition. And again, this is impact that service users reported. 
However, this um, reporting can only happen in safe spaces, which also led us to think that actually what is being measured is not the end all be all of the powerful impact of arts on health. And what we need to get better in doing is expanding the way of working with the art form and the target population and developing new partnerships so that we can understand, for example, what are, is the knowledge exchange that is happening with health professionals, such as mental health nurses and occupational therapists who are learning on the side of our artists and our arts facilitators. And again, this is interprofessional knowledge that is very difficult um, to capture. So now I'm gonna pass on to um, Kate from Head for Arts, who will introduce her organization and the groundbreaking work that they've been undertaking. Thank you, Sophia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not a great fan of, um, uh, of presentations with lots of words. So this is the only slide that I'll be using with, with words on it. But basically Head for Arts is a partnership of local authorities and leisure trusts delivering community arts across the counties of Blyne Gwent, Caffili, Merthyr Tidbal and Torvine. Um, we have offices in Llanelleth in Blyne Gwent, but all our work is outreach and it's often in collaboration with other partners, mostly of whom have no link to arts practice. So we're quite experienced at working to other people's agendas, but still using that as the basis for creative practice. Our mission is to use inspiring arts programmes to change the way people see themselves and the world around them. And it's also about unlocking cultural poverty, uh, including promoting good mental and physical health, unlocking potential and helping to build resilient and sustainable communities. Next slide, thanks. I love this picture. For me, it shows the heart of what we do is about working with people. And they come in all shapes and sizes, uh, we work across all ages and all art forms. Sometimes we work with specific target groups. They may be communities of interest, communities of circumstance or of location. But quite often we work with whoever just turns up. There may be common priorities, but everyone brings their own mix of talents and challenges. Um, and I, I love this photograph because as you can see, if you're looking carefully, some of those legs don't actually have a pair. <laughs> so um, we're used to dealing with people in all their uniqueness. And we find that people never conform entirely to one single category and have multiple issues that ad adversely affect their ability to thrive. Next slide, please. I've chosen to uh, show Celtic Cafe as a, as a case study because this is a really good example of how we, uh, an organization like ours is able to experiment um, be, and actually uh, how an, um, a project can evolve into something that more adequately serves the need of the community beyond how we originally envisaged it. Um, also, this is one of our, uh, the few uh, long-term projects we have that meets on a regular weekly basis. And it's been going since 2010. And it was set up as a way of introducing young people to traditional music, particularly Welsh music, because at that time, if you went into any session, you might have heard Irish or Scottish music, but you rarely heard Welsh music. And we set it in a heritage centre in the cafe because that was a place where children could be welcome. And as you can see, it's a really lovely uh, modern cafe attached to the uh, Heritage Centre. And it's also got a lovely outdoor space that we can use as well. Initially, it was a typical uh, children's workshop where parents dropped off their children and came and collected them afterwards. But then we realised that if we were trying to um, uh, connect local people with the use of this, this wonderful cafe, which was usually dead after three o'clock, that it would be a good idea to invite parents to come along rather than just be chauffeurs. And gradually the parents came too and um, stayed and had coffee and became an audience. And then some of them started bringing the rest of the family and um, also started learning alongside their children. 
So now we were on to looking at um, being a family workshop. We were quite interested to find how many single parents were attending the sessions and also how many of them had children on the autistic spectrum. Um, our participants became younger and also they became older as grandparents came along too. From that point, we started having um, other people joining, adults without children who were either particularly interested in doing a bit of traditional music or perhaps um, that they were lonely and just needed a bit of company. Um, we had carers bringing uh, uh, people with dementia or people with learning difficulties. Um, and uh, sometimes we had carers who were coming there just as a bit of me time as the one thing they did on their own. It was really interesting to see how this particular group has evolved. And as you can see from the pictures, they also interact with their community, performing um, quite often at the local care home and also uh, showcased at places like the Millennium Stadium and the Millennium Center, sorry, not the stadium. But at heart, what this has evolved into is actually just a, this safe space that Sophia was talking about, um, where people are brought together through sharing an arts activity and in this case obviously it's music we can see how that is impacting on the well-being of that community and how it could link with social prescribing but it's interesting we've never actually been able to access any health funding streams for this venture uh, to support it largely because it cuts across a number of different target groups rather than focusing on just one bring to mind that original picture we work with people the people in the room um, can I have the next slide, slide please? Um, um, so our second case study illustrates that other thing about how we can uh, influence the work of other professionals. And this is uh, um, a response to the fact we are often inundated with a demand from voluntary organisations <clears throat> that uh, are uh, promoting uh, health and wellbeing for uh, artists to come and work with their clients. And we haven't got the resources to fulfil this demand um, especially the sort of one-to-one -one interventions they sometimes have in mind. So we thought we'd tackle it in a different way. And we went back to the, um, uh, this in this case, this is a, a project we ran for Garvo uh, and it's training for training sessions for organizations where um, their, their workers, their staff and their volunteers do that sort of one-to-one -one work with, with clients. So we were teaching them a range of art skills by having um, sessions with very skilled professional uh, community artists um, and teaching them a, a range of craft skills <clears throat> that they could then um, use themselves and embed that practice, that, that work into their practice. And it's harnessing the power of the arts to engage people in, in an informal and a relaxed way through the, the promotion of fun activities but it can, can provide a context for starting conversations and consultations in, a, in, a, in the less intimidating scenario of creating something together. Um, this is, uh, as I said, was for Garvo, but Head for Art is currently running something similar for Bernardo's, for Caffili Parent Network, and more recently with Crew's Bereavement Care staff and volunteers. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, about our uh, work under the um, project that uh, the heart project that Sophia was mentioning. Um, we were working uh, as part of the Anira and Bevan UHB's exploration of how the arts could be embedded into better into their practice. And the part that we were specifically working on was called Galari, which is a, a creative bereavement project. And um, we were looking at different ways of supporting people with bereavement um, in uh, different means of supporting people who are grieving, both remotely and face to face, and being able to adapt to whatever COVID precautions were in place. So remotely, we started with the provision of butterfly origami packs that generated elements for um, a memorial uh, installation at the Grange Hospital. Um, but and a bigger project was the development of this journal you could see you can see pictured here and it's something that could be passed to grieving relatives and we're, we at the moment we're, we're piloting it with um uh the end of life team volunteers um and it's a beautifully handcrafted journal that has been put together by um um creative writer french and printer francesca Kay. 
and um, it's something that um, can be used to uh, aid reflection on their emotions uh, throughout their, their journey of bereavement and, and it could be used as a starting point for counselling sessions so that people can remember how they felt at particular times even if they, they can't, aren't feeling that at the particular moment and even if it isn't used it can act as this precious gift from staff demonstrating an acknowledgement of their bereavement. Um, the other project we're looking at here is uh, Galari's uh, Making a Memory, sorry, back one, sorry, <laughs> still on that, yeah, um, is Making a Memories, which is happening at the moment. In fact, there's a session this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon. And this is, um, uh, again, creating this safe space where people can meet together. And in this case, it, we're using craft as the focus. And people can come together, bringing their grief with them, knowing that everyone else is in the room is there also, who will also be grieving in, in some respects. In this way, the elephant is in the room with us as they make things like memory boxes and, um, and things to put in them. And people can talk about death and loss if they want to or not, um, without any fear of embarrassing people or making them feel uncomfortable. And I have to say, there's a lot of laughter in those rooms and um, uh, people are, are making those connections. And we're, we're working with people who have been re, um, bereaved um, some months back and are still struggling, but also people who have picked up the notice from um, undertakers uh, and are very, have been very recently bereaved. And we're finding, just as I said before, that there's a multiple complexity of problems. Uh, for example, the woman we met last week who was struggling with um, caring for her uh, father who has dementia at the same time as she's grieving for the loss of her mother. Um, these sessions are self-referring from posters displayed in libraries, community centres, undertakers and the venues themselves. And our participants tell us that grief can be absolutely exhausting and that this provides a welcome break where they can enjoy creative activities in a pleasant venue. We've got a parallel project on the go at the moment, Kel Bitholwyr, and that's uh, looking at how um, creative arts and the natural environment can impact on bereavement. Um, final slide, thank you. And I'm using this slide to illustrate how things can come together. This is just an, a, a, a picture of our last community plate we did um, about um, the, in, to commemorate uh, the anniversary of World War I. And in it, you can see on the far left, there is our Stroke Association choir who are using uh, choir, uh, singing to help with their aphasia. We've got people in wheelchairs who are uh, uh, coming along to a different choir. We have in the front row, we've got somebody who's 94 who was isolated by their age. We've got people with autism. We've got people with other disabilities, mental uh, issues. Um, and we have our audience, but they're all working together. And we work, as I said, with whoever uh, we, we find. And um, sometimes we're working specifically for a need that's been identified. Sometimes we identify the needs that we're satisfying. But uh, um, uh, I can, in, in every case, it's that engagement with um, creative activity that has proved the catalyst to people helping to manage their own health. Thank you. Back to Sophia. <laughs> so we just wanted to uh, finally share with you our resources. So you can find information about the HARP project in this link and it contains all of our outputs, uh, digital stories, tools for healthcare professionals. And also please feel free to reach out to us as well. Uh, we are embarking on a new project um, as well, funded by the British Academy, where we will be looking specifically at creative aging and social prescribing and trying to bridge the gap between community arts, art therapy, social prescribing, see, and also cultural activities that benefit health that are not labeled as a health promoting activity. It's because what we found is that definitions is a really 
big thing, you know, and there are interconnections between areas that operate completely independently. So this is the end of our presentation. And we'd like now to invite you to um, send us your questions in using the chat below the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sophia and Kate. That was a really engaging and interesting presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, please, as I said at the start, um, just use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the um, page. Or if you would like to raise your hand and read your question out yourself, you can. And we have had a couple of questions come in, so I'm just going to put those to you both, um, if I may. Um, so the first question is, um, do you work in North Wales or consider working with an organisation in North Wales? So would you be able to answer that for us yeah um i mean i even though i'm based in cardiff university the people that i worked with are uh, people who applied for our projects and uh, one i think our only north wales partner was Denbyshire council and they deliver a creative intervention for uh, professionals who work in care homes that are owned by the council. And what the artists did is they were trying to find appropriate ways um, to reach them, but um, we're very open to new collaborations as well. If uh, anybody in North Wales would like to collaborate with us. And can I also say that um, there are very good arts, community arts organisations in North Wales. Uh, I, I've just told you about the things that we're doing in South East Wales. And yes, we have, on occasions come up to North Wales, but it's it's not cost effective. It's not the best way of, of operating. There are brilliant local artists and um, um, Head for Arts is part of uh, Arts Council of Wales' national portfolio of arts providers and others are available. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Um, another question that's come in, um, how, uh, how has the pandemic affected this area of work, particularly uh, the more one-to-one -one type engagement? Um, I don't know if you were able to share um, either through your experiences or your research, um, yeah, yeah, how the pandemic's affected um, this area of work. Kate, would you like to go first? Yeah. Yes, certainly. I mean, um, uh, when the pandemic hit us, we spent one day cancelling the contracts of all our community arts practitioners and there were about sort of 35 of them and then the next day we practically re-engaged them all because we changed the way we worked we didn't stop for the entire time in fact we were busier than ever uh, what we did was we engaged those artists to create craft packs linked to health and well-being and in the interim we worked with um, uh, we identified the organisations that were doing door-to-door -door deliveries, food and medication. We knew that that would be the first priority to get that set up, that nobody wanted to talk about the arts until they knew that people in isolation were fed and had the medication. But we knew that the next thing on the list would be looking after health and well-being and we were ready for them and um, we worked with a whole load of different artists um, they created something from scratch we're not talking about you know a pack of pencils and a pad we're talking about really cleverly crafted things with a with with a a, a, a link to um, supporting well-being and um, something that could be done by anybody without having to have access to the internet, because that was a really big issue. Uh, and then we produced about four and a half thousand of those. Um, in the, with this project, as I mentioned, with the uh, Bereavement Journal and the Origami uh, Packs, um, yeah, that, that, that was specifically to look at this issue about how you support people uh, during isolation and online. And I know that some, uh, like with the project uh, that was done by Span Art, uh, Community arts organisations are very creative in, in their way of dealing with things. And we just learned how to do new things. And the biggest surprise hit, I have to say, is I learned origami because origami is really good to do online and everyone has a piece of paper. Have I answered that? Oh, origami, love the sound of that. I'd uh, <laughs> quite happily be involved in that session. Um, Another question's come in, it's quite similar to the first, but um, what practical first steps would someone in healthcare take to engage um, to bring art into their setting? Um, I don't know if uh, you perhaps touched on that, I think perhaps in the first question, but if you could just uh, just tackle that one for us. 
well, there's one of the partners is Wahoon, which I would say would be a really good starting point, wouldn't you, Sophia? Yes, um, it's. Um, I, I would say also because I, I, I suppose this question is quite generic. I would say that also depending if the organization is uh, a public body, um, each health board has an arts and health coordinator. So I would say they would be yeah. your your first point of call if you are working within the uh, within a specific health board. Um, and if you are a charity yeah, joining the Wahoo network, and I'm going to put a link in the chat also, we'll put you in touch with um, training that is available through them as well um, for the sector and, and connections. Um, I, I, I think also I hope that what we communicated also in this presentation is that it's not all rosy and easy and it requires investment and understanding from you know both sides of the arts and health spectrum you know and I think um, something that we find is that because it's arts and health is such you know it's a desirable outcome you know but the groundwork to to achieve the this level of embeddedness and functionality is quite high and i don't think everybody um has the time uh, and you know the resources available to put into this brokering because effectively you know you're bringing two worlds together that you know, can uh, uh, overwhelmingly transform each other as well. You know, and as Kate mentioned earlier, you know, with the pandemic, yes, the first priority was to keep people safe and to keep people COVID free. And if we look, for example, at care homes and the frail and the elderly, isolation, social isolation and physical isolation in this sense had an, an immense impact on people's mental health. You know, and that's why there was an increase in suicide attempts as soon as you know lockdown ended. You know, so um, the the arts can have a, a huge impact in improving people's mental health remotely, as we found, you know, during COVID. However, the issue there is um, access to digital engagement. Do people have the devices, the know-how to go on a Zoom call? So if they're yeah. over 80, for example, do they have the relevant um, infrastructure, such as the right Wi-Fi package, you know, mm. so that they are able to engage? And a lot of charities, invested in this infrastructure that then enabled isolated people to be able to access the arts remotely. Another thing I'd like to add is um, that uh, as a community arts organization, we've had a huge difficulty in really engaging properly with social uh, prescribing. And that's because I mentioned that Celtic Cathy is one of the unusual um, activities that we've actually funded from our small budget to have weekly sessions because what people need is to know that something is happening um, and um, we can't persuade well we have failed um, to persuade health boards to uh, create these safe spaces like Celtic Cafe so therefore there are less of them that we were able to to suggest as uh, um, that, that, that uh, social prescribers can signpost people towards most of our work tends to be project based and time limited but if if there was the potential to have more regular work it would bring huge benefits oh, thank thank you so much for answering those um those questions i think that's all we've got in the way of questions now i think they've all come in and i think you, i can see you provided some links so that's really helpful um so to our attendees if you would like to use those links i recommend that you copy and paste those uh, into your browser uh, now if you can um because i'm not sure if they i'm not sure if they stay once the zoom call comes to an end so i'll just give you a few seconds to do those uh, just while you do that, it's just left to me to thank our two brilliant speakers uh, this morning, uh, Sophia and Kate, and thank you very much for your presentation and answering the questions. And um, I hope all our attendees found that useful, interesting uh, and helpful. So, yeah, thank you very much both. Thank you for having us. And 
Also, uh, to our audience, please feel free to reach out if you have any specific questions or if you'd like Kate to work with your organization, for example. Or recommend another one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much both. Thanks a lot. Bye now.